Funding for Minnesota's Lost Mining Towns is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. On the Iron Range, everything was subject to move. The Iron Range is the one place that they have to fly over on a regular basis for topography because it's the only place in Minnesota that's constantly changing. Well, the mining properties knew from the beginning when they came to the Misaba Range that they're going to have to do something about all these people they need to mine. They simply allowed an area close to the ore body and said, you can build a house there. The result was tar paper shacks, little shanties, the first kind of location that came on. The place where the miners lived as well as the mine site and all of the associated activities that went with it. So now that meant that the miners could be within walking distance of the, of the mine, and that area where they lived was the mining location. I went through a count once, I counted 111 that I know of, but I've been told there's 145. But they didn't all exist at the same time. Many times, three or four locations were gone, and then two more were coming up, depending on wherever the mining is concerned. Once the mining activity ended, that's usually what spelled the death knell to the location if it were a, an isolated one. If it were close to another mine, then perhaps that other company could add work, a workforce to it. It was always something in the back of their minds because they knew that the land on which their location house was built was the mining companies. They could do anything with it. The old timers that actually remembered the towns, this is where they lived, you know, it was as much a part of their family as their family. And they built their lives there, they went to school there, they built their dreams on this town. And for whatever reason, mostly economic, the town just died and, the, and they left, but it still remained a part of their consciousness. It was their home. We've got lots of history and lots of ghost towns. <laughs> In the 1890s, good ore was found on the Mesaba Range. But the ore that was found on the Mesaba Range wasn't the kind of ore that you find anywhere else. Not only was it close to the surface, but there was lots of it. It seemed at the time, in the early 1890s, that the ore was endless. There would never be an end to it. 90 miles of ore pockets all across the range. The term location is actually something that goes back to the 19th century when uh, mining oper operators and entrepreneurs and prospectors were looking for sites where they could engage in mining and a term developed at that time called the mine location. It meant exactly that, that it was where the mine would be found. Well, the Tower Mine set the world's record in 1895 for the production of iron ore. 500,000 tons of ore in that. It took 8,000 men to do it. It was a place that was labor intensive. There were jobs for anyone who wanted to work was the idea. Uh, our mining companies had to advertise for working. The 19th century is characterized by what is known as paternalism, and that's the idea as we see in the, on the Mosabi Range and elsewhere on the Iron Range with, with the idea of providing housing, 
providing these basic services for the workers. But there was a very definite trade-off at that time in that the workers did surrender um, much of their independence and they were so dependent upon the company for that. To them, it still gave them opportunity. It was a dream. Back in their countries, they didn't have that. You could do well on the Misaba Range with plain immigrant workers, unskilled workers, because the iron ore was soft, powdery, and could be easily removed from the ground. Transportation wasn't great in those days, and it was so much more practical to have the workers live right next to the mine. The squatters' locations were the places where the miners and their families just moved in without even having any precept of a plan or any organizational principles involved with it. So they simply squatted on the land. When you look at the map of it, you can just tell it's, it's chaos. I mean, there's no, no rhyme or reason to the way the houses were built, and there's not really any lines to the streets, and to get from one corner to the next was kind of a, a craziness. They were still very uh, important and often in areas that were just initially being mined before there was any organized sort of surveying going on. And by far the most common place of the locations were the company locations. And these were the ones where you could get the T-square of the mining engineer coming into play and they would plot out these very rigorously rectilinear uh, communities with uh, similar size house lots. Often the housing would be very similar as well. Some of those other locations were really, really refined and the roads are on a nice grid system and those are the ones that, you know, had the electricity, had the running water, they had, you know, the schools and everything were built in real nice order. And then there were a few model locations and these often were the ones, there were two purposes. One was to provide a place for the better salaried workers and the other one is to give a more favorable public face to the general community to show what the mining companies could do for their workers. They were also very um, self-contained. They're very self-contained. They had their own, uh, everything they needed or wanted or could possibly think they wanted to do, the company provided that. Another, you know, very much a company town. Very small group of managers compared to the whole population. And again, everything is dependent on that mine and at the owner's whim. So really the, the uh, company locations were there to bring in miners, to keep them satisfied, to keep them working. And of course, at the same time, providing for their families because basically they wanted married workers who tended to be more dependable and perhaps more obedient and less prone to go on strikes. Thus, the importance of the immigrant worker here, particularly on the Misaba Range, and thus the reason for our locations and our minds. What made the Iron Range, especially the Masabi, such a unique cultural landscape is that there were these boardwalks extending for miles from the town site off to the, to the different locations. And that would be, it must have been just a remarkable sight to see. This is Genoa location. And we're looking at the buildings around here and the remains of whatever the Genoa location was. It was a suburb of old Sparta. And this was connected with a board sidewalk but there were something like 44 sites in this area, 44 little towns, most of them locations. But the rents were really quite economical, so it was affordable for the workers, whereas if they would have had to come into the region from elsewhere and find housing in a town site, they could not have afforded it at first. Rent was a well, five dollars a month, maybe ten dollars a month. It it was really reasonable when you compare the uh, the services you had. Uh, they used to come every spring, take off the storm windows and wash the windows and put the screens up. And in the fall, they'd take the screens down, wash the windows, and wash the storm, and put new storm windows up. So uh, they took care of them uh, pretty good. There was a typical company houses. They had about three three different styles. And on one corner was the biggest house, was a three-story house. 
which belonged to the superintendent. He was like your little Jesus. He, he was uh, the, the law in the mining company. Uh, you went, you talked to him or inquired anything you wanted to him, I asked, because uh, he was the guy that gave you the answer. But all the locations were mining locations, run by the company. You, sh you drew your water at the company well. You did your shopping according to the company. Most of them in the early days especially didn't have indoor plumbing or water. You had to use a community pump. Just think my mother, when she was living in that shed out there in Exmoor, she had to haul her water with a four-wheel steel wheel wagon, you know, in a barrel. She hauled it about a half a mile. So that was no fun. She, she raised three kids out there. The company usually didn't want anything that was of an econo economic nature. So there were very few locations that had stores. So they were totally dependent upon the services that were provided in the town sites. Everything from medical, of course, and especially to the commercial activities of just the day-to-day -day life where you could go and purchase something from a store. Any shopping you had to do, like clothing and groceries, you had to go to town. While well, transportation wasn't the best, so all the stores in town used to have a truck and he had a little book and your mother would tell him what she wanted, you know. Then in the afternoon they would come with the groceries. So gee, that was really neat. Order in the morning, in the afternoon again. The nice thing about those days was supposing in the winter time or something you were laid off, those stores all give you credit. They let you buy groceries on credit and then and when you started working in the spring. And they even plowed the the main street with a team of horses, they pulled some kind of a V-shaped plow in front. It didn't do a very good job, but it, that's all they had. Anyhow, the mining company used to, uh, they used to have picnics on the 4th of July. It was you know, a pretty big thing. Kids have to have a white shirt on and a, and a tie and, and, and a, you know, go to the lake or something. And that's when the mining companies would have picnics. They may have had a hard life, I've got pictures of my grandpa in the, in the mines, and you know, they're dirty, they're hardworking, but when they got home, they cleaned up and they, they put on their Sunday best and they had their social time together, and you could tell by the looks of the people's faces that, you know, they were community. They were great yards and, and families, and they all had or, ornamental trees, and each, each house usually had a crab tree and a couple of other trees that were planted because, of course, they cleared everything when they built the town site. And we have one of the or, ornamental crab trees that's still growing here. There was a basketball court on the lower side where the kids used to play basketball and kind of had their own hoop and their own blacktop court. When I came in 1954 to Taconite Harbor, Silver Bay was just kind of in its infancy of being built, and they were just starting to clear the area for Taconite Harbor. So there was a definite boom kind of energy where Taconite had just been developed. Schroeder has always been a boom or bust place, and Taconite Harbor maybe being the third boom. I mean, the first one was the John Schroeder Lumber Company. The second one was the Consolidated Paper Company, which basically logged black spruce in the entire region and shipped it out down at Sugarloaf Landing. So the third big boom here being the taconite industry. And in the early 1950s, Two gigantic taconite projects were begun on the eastern Mesabi. A production reality at last. Minnesota's new taconite industry was producing millions of tons of pellets a year. They were in the process, the mining companies themselves, of developing taconite, and they needed a place to ship it quickly and efficiently, which Taconite Harbor certainly served that. Boat turnaround here or carrier turnaround is like three, four hours and start to finish. So, so Taconite Harbor was ideally located and ideally located for shipping Taconite 
to everywhere in the United States that it was needed. Taconite Harbor shipped 10 million tons for several years. Economists will say that a boom and bust system is built on one industry or one resource, and, and mainly in northern Minnesota, it was logging and mining. It's built on that one resource. Everything, all the people in that town and everything in that town was heavily dependent on that resource. And as long as the resource was there, things were great. 55, 56, 57, it was all construction. 500 little 20 by eight foot trailers that all the families lived in. And there's big trucks everywhere and people and uh, lots of stuff going on. I think it was a $300, $300 million plan at the time, which was way over the top. All the trailers left and then the Taconite homes came in and they started the, the homes at Taconite Harbor and named the little village Taconite Harbor and, and then the people that actually ran the railroad, the power plant and the loading docks lived here and lived in the area. We had ball fields and ball teams and we had, uh, you know, activities that basically all these people were involved in from social town hall gatherings and dances to, you know, picnics and, and of course we had the natural recreation that is here with the fishing and the woods and the wilderness. And it really did kind of put Schroeder and Tofty on the map as far as great paying jobs, good benefits, wonderful place to raise a family. It just seems like uh, Taconite Harbor was just very much a leave it to beaver suburbia. They had backyard barbecues and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and, and it was just a kind of idyllic setting right on the shores of Lake Superior. It was really a, a, a fun place to grow up as a kid and I worked in the store. So I got to see everybody every day, you know, I mean, because everybody came to the store. This is the entrance to the old Taconite Harbor town site. You can see the street light that basically was the first light that you saw when you drove into the homes. On the, on the right hand side was a, a, a row of 12 homes that extended on down toward the end of the street with curbs and gutters and front yards and kids and, and people. And then over here on the left was the other row of homes. It was a neat planned community. These were great houses with attached garages and basements and three bedrooms and ideal for families and for growing up here in Taconite Harbor and in Schroeder. Hoyt Lakes, which is the end of the iron range that our Taconite pellets came from, eventually uh, downsized and then eventually closed their Taconite making facility and so that, in the late 70s and early 80s, kind of set the stage for downsizing of Taconite Harbor. It wasn't too long and the, the homes were gone and they took down the streets and they filled in the basements and it basically just got shut down. So obviously all the homes closed and they were moved away. So we became a ghost town at Taconite Harbor, which was actually pretty sad. I, I feel bad for the kids that were raised there. After that occurred, the DNR decided to put in a harbor, a harbor of refuge at Taconite Harbor. And we are part of the boom and bust of the Iron Range. So it's important to remember that those cycles really do go up and down and they have huge peaks and valleys. And, um, and so, uh, we're hopeful that some of that will come back. It's hard to kind of imagine that there will be another boom like John Schroeder Lumber Company or the Taconite Harbor Erie Mining Company, but I don't know. As mining progressed, we moved into an era of what we call the big company big mining company. And of course the big steel producer for the Misabi Range and the Vermilion Range for that matter was United States Steel Corporation. And its subsidiary company, the Oliver. In 1915, they had a workforce of 10,000 workers. 
Of these 10,000, less than 10% could speak the language. They hired almost entirely immigrant workers. Seems like the prevailing uh, philosophy of the mining company was to mix the groups to some degree. And that way they wouldn't tend to group together, perhaps and form, maybe agitate as much. And I think they had a lot of dependency on each other. And even though I'd say most of them couldn't even speak to each other, you know, with the language barrier. And yet they're forced into these places, you know, this is a place where we can make a living. We can have a family. Many descriptions of the Iron Range I've read of that time, they talk about the babble of tongues on the range. I'm Swedish descent. I might be living next door to an Italian. On the other side might be a Finnish person, Romanian, but we were all mixed up. Got along real good. It was a very tight-knit community, helping each other out, helping the neighbors, even if they spoke different languages. One of my closest buddies, his grandparents lived down there on Sellers Street uh, by 3rd Avenue. They were Finnish, didn't speak any English. And uh, some of my other friends, Croatians, Slavs, whatever, uh, their grandparents generally didn't speak any English. And, uh, but anyway, everybody got along. We had a great time. In fact, many of the children couldn't speak the English language when they came to school. In fact, all of us, a kid that we played together, all of us knew a few words in every language. That was actually one of the main purposes of public schools in those days, was to get children to speak English and Americanize them. And then they'd go back and, and actually a lot of times talk for their parents, and then they'd talk to other people, and just living among them, you picked up the language. The school used to have furnished night school in the location schools, and these foreigners that couldn't speak used to go to school, learn to speak the language and the history of the United States and stuff, so they could take a test before a judge to pass for the citizenship paper. And my grandmother was one of the first women that she went through and got her naturally, naturalization papers taken care of. She's, she could speak four different languages. She sometimes would serve as translator for some of the people around here. They respected people that had education so that uh, a priest or a minister or school teacher was highly thought of in the in, uh, to them, you know. They had foreign language papers on the range. The most popular foreign language papers were the Slovenian and the Finnish papers, naturally because those are the largest number of immigrants. My grandma's philosophy, you know, was don't speak Finn when you're not at home and you need to learn to speak your English. And there was this whole different, you know, two different philosophies of what goes on here is one thing and what happens, you know, when you're in the community, we're all connected and we're all part of the same community. In the beginning, most of the people who lived in those mining communities or locations were young men and they lived in boarding houses and they didn't, they could, the food was prepared for them, their room was prepared for them and they just basically went to work. Most of those towns had, were made up at least by half of boarding houses. Locations were the same way and the people who operated them were the immigrant, first immigrant businessmen on the range really, the boarding house people. The mines generally would work on shifts and they would call, I think they called it hot sheeting, but they would have, you know, the daytime workers would go to the mine and work and someone would sleep in their bed and then they'd have a meal and then the next group would come and take the beds over. Sounds horrid to me, but um, they would just, you know, all three shifts would have that same room. We had a babysitter when I first moved to Aurora by the name of Mary Bratten. She was of Norwegian extraction and her husband was as well and she came to Old Misaba in 1890. She said when she came there to Misaba, which was then a booming city, it was the first town on the range, Old Misaba, full of hotels and gaming houses and bars and saloons like many Iron Range towns. So 
One day the mining captain from the nearby Adriatic mine came over and asked her if she would take in some boarders. She said, oh, I suppose I could take a few. Well, she went there, she had 12 boarders. Some were sleeping on the floor, some were sleeping out in the hay barn. They were all over the place and she had to take care of them. She said, oh, that's when I learned to be tough, she said. Those guys, she said, you had to take care of them. They were like little kids all over. They smoked, they fell asleep with cigarettes lit in their mouth. She said, you had to go there and pull them out. You had to take care of them. She said, lucky for me, she said, I had four hardworking daughters. There were four girls in the family. One particular family, they had a big family of their own. And they had a, a lot of boarders. The people were really industrious. They worked hard, though. And the mother, that only run, had to take care of her children. She had to take care of all the boarders, and she had cows and gardens and that, but they were smart. They also used to make the boarders go out and help cut hay, mm -hmm. and help around the cows, and help in the gardens and stuff. It kind of got to be like a family in a way. And uh, yet the boarder had, knew he was indebted, uh, whatever it was, uh, for his uh, board fee make their lunch pail, send them off to work. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tough dollar too, I guess. But there was sure a lot of that. She said in the morning, especially when everybody woke up, she said it was just, just a free-for-all, you know. Trying to, everybody wanted to get to work and uh, trying to eat something and uh, everybody's in everybody's way. And, but it was mostly a single guy trying to save money however he could to get his wife here. And then they usually did, you know, send her the money so she could get here. And they were only making five bucks a week them days. So uh, the, the boardroom had to be as cheap as possible. That's how the Iron Range is different. For the most part, in the farming communities, you wanted large families of strong sons. The women didn't count. But on the range, if you have daughters, you're on your way to some good times. First thing they did, look for a piece of land to have a big garden. Because they, that, of course, they knew how to garden. So then they'd get a lot out of the ground, out of the soil. And then they'd try to supplement themselves with a cow or two, or a hog or something. So then they had a little meat, milk, and stuff out of the garden. <coughs> well, my father had some around the house here. He had, uh, at that time, he had a pretty big piece of land right here. And then he had some on, a, on company land over in what they call sawmill location. The mining company used to have one major big garden, then each person had a strip. And the company very often used to pay for the plowing of it. Mm -hmm. I can still remember the guy plowing it with a horse. They wanted the uh, miners to be able to support themselves somewhat with their gardens because they realized that perhaps they were not getting enough in the terms of wages but by having a garden, they could do so. And especially, they would also encourage potatoes because they could be grown in bulk and they could grow them in common. So often there would be a potato field for the community or the location on the outskirts. And there was a lot of pride involved. You know, you didn't want to have a bunch of weeds alongside of your neighbor that was an articular gardener. And then every, every fall, oh, I can remember my dad, he felt pretty important. They used to come out and judge the potatoes and who had the potato would get five dollars and had the best potato. And I remember, oh, my dad was proud. He won five dollars one year. He had the best potato. So over time, the companies began to have garden contests, and then they would be printed up in the company newsletter. So if you're really very successful, you could have your picture with your garden and sometimes your whole family there in showing the very productive nature of your garden. The company even built a um, community root cellar, which was a fantastic benefit for those who lived in the area. They could raise, you know, gardens, vegetables, and uh, fruits, whatever, and they had a place to store them over the winter. Now, the mining company built that as an attractor to get employees to work in the mines. They encouraged the miners to engage in growing gardens because that was another way to keep them occupied 
uh, and they would be they'd be less prone then to uh, engage in uh, labor organizing or thinking of strikes. I think there's this good quote from uh, U.S. Steel Corporation as the uh, benefits of having a house in a location. The man who has learned to take pride in his garden hurries home from his work, spending little time in loitering and none in the saloon. Therefore, the garden tends to reduce alcoholism. The man standing in the community is raised, and what is even better, his own self-respect is promoted. We're here at the Glen location, which is between Hibbing and Chisholm, just south of Chisholm, south of the pit, on a Minnesota Discovery property. Not all of these locations are accessible. You know, due to mining, uh, a lot of the locations are fall within the perimeter of a mining plan. And because of liabilities and stuff, it's, it's almost impossible to access those locations. Well, welcome aboard Minnesota's Discovery Center's trolley. My name is Kathy. I'll be your conductor throughout the tour today. Trolleys like this one played a vital role in early iron range transportation. This beautiful piece of land is called the Pillsbury Mine Pit. And as we stop here, you're going to see a lot of other pits as we go. There's the Leonard, Monroe, Dunwoody, Douglas, and Glen Mines. This foundation is thought to be the Bayless home, which was a superintendent of the Glen Mine. The evidence of this foundation shows that it in fact was brought in on site and the foundation was actually constructed after the building was placed in this location. We know that this uh, building was hauled in from about six miles off of a different property. You can tell by this channel that runs down the length of this footing that there was a support beam at this location, one in the center and then one on the, end, the other end of the home. Okay. Another indication that this building was moved in place is that the area between the rim joist and the first floor joist has never been finished because it was unable to get a trowel up in this area to smooth it out. I think it's phenomenal. You get a chance to walk around at the Discovery Center, you can actually physically see it and touch it and see how, you know, and you can actually put a history together on how this building was moved here. That's what everybody was looking for, a company house. They were a little, a little better, and not only that, they were pretty well maintained and they were close to work usually right on the edge of the mine, so you didn't need transportation, you could walk to work. In fact, those houses were heaven compared to what some of the people lived in. They were really nice, and the company maintained them well. We had fences around them and sidewalks. Every house uh, that I lived in a mine location had running water. Some of the houses had indoor toilets, but most of them had the outside privy. We had a kitchen wood stove usually, and then every house had a, a a coal stove in the in in the living room that you heated the whole house with, and some people they uh, used to haul wood and saw wood and that, and then if you had a woodshed, I forgot to tell you we had a woodshed. We used to pile the wood in there. We used for kindling and for heating. All all all, all kids in the location we had chores. You know, your dad used to work 10, 12 hours. You know, and then when he come home he was tired. You know, so we all had to bring in wood. And we all had to split some of the wood fine up for kindling so he could start fire in the morning to cook coffee and make breakfast. I feel kind of uh, lived in a unique era because when I was a kid we started with horses in the mine and I ended up now today landing on the moon so that's quite a era. You know this is a physical part of history you could touch. It's a tangible part where uh, so much of history you know you read in the books and it's it's mythical.
On the Iron Range, everything was subject to move. All, most of these locations you see on this map have already been mined out. Latonia, it's been here for a long time. Originally, it was up in here, then it moved over to here, and then this was the final resting place for the, for the location itself. I had the fortunate opportunity to work for the Great Northern Trust, it would be Great Northern Iron Ore Properties. And in my position there, I did almost all of the cartography. I made the maps, you know, for the engineering department, uh, for mine expansions. Over the years, I ended up researching just about every location across the range. Kittsville still exists. It's right next to the highway, right off of 169. But you can see there's Nassau, Red Ore, Mitchell, Nelson, Burton is down here, the Webb location. Uh, North Hibbing, this section here is gone. Up the street from where I lived was, was uh, Spruce Hill location, and that's actually a big hole in the ground now. And uh, I remember uh, there was Chicken Town on the way, <laughs> on the way from, Leon, from West Eveleth to Eveleth. There was a little location called Chicken Town, and that's, that's gone. And even the, the road from West Eveleth to Eveleth moved three times in my lifetime. And that's the idea that all of us on the range have been brought up with. Nothing is permanent. They built their lives there, they went to school there, they built their dreams on this town, and for whatever reason, mostly economic, the town just died and, the, and they left. That meant that the housing was removed typically and then was brought to other parts of the range. So after a while, the location houses had a combination of the original houses and those that were moved from elsewhere. If the house was worth it, they moved it. If it wasn't, they tore it down. In some cases, the mining company more or less told them to leave because they had to use the land for something else. There was some notice given with uh, maybe several weeks or months before they would have to move. But uh, sometimes the company would actually make an effort to find another location or more housing for them. Oh yes, my dad got transferred to different jobs, uh, you know, different mi uh, mines, and to be closer to work. The mining superintendent, he would find a house for you in that location. They'd always try to manage to have a house vacant, so if they had some employee they wanted, they could move into it. Uh, we lived in the Kerr location. I was over in Hibbing, on the west end of Hibbing. And uh, we lived the longest time in Morris location. I got drafted in 1940 from the Morris location to the Army. And they, during the war, they mined out the Morris location, so there was no more Morris location. They moved the houses out of there. So when I came out of the Army, I didn't even know where I lived. <laughs> I went to a, a lady's house, you know, and her name was Anna, and I knew her. And I knocked on the door, and here she came to the door. I didn't know where she lived. There. She, I said, hi, Anna, she's 40. I said, where do I live, Anna? She said, four doors down. So that's <laughs> how I knew. I didn't even know where I lived. To move buildings was very common. There's a lot of people that made a living just moving houses. During the summertime, 10, 11 years old, we go down and sit and watch them run them dollies out on them timbers in the basement, put the house down on it, and off they go. But the big move was the North Hibbing move. That was the big move. But the Myers location was moved, the Webb, the Glen, Monroe, Fraser, all of them were moved. Just about the whole Iron Range has moved at one time or another. The house I live in was moved from Penobscot location to 3rd Avenue East in Hibbing. If you grew up here, you kind of know that, especially if you live on leased property, you, you have a pretty good understanding of what can happen. I think life those days was a lot better with the slower pace. There was no, uh, I don't think we even had a key for a door in a house. No, nobody ever locked the door in location and, and uh, everybody washed out for everybody. I think in reality that's what Lost Towns are about, it's the people. You know, it's not so much the company or the mine, certainly that was the impetus for the town or the location or whatever, but it was the people. What is your family history on the Iron Range? Iron Range, we came, uh, my dad came in 19, 1902. Uh, my sister, my mother came in 1903. My brother John, brother Xavier, and I came in 1905. 
How old were you when you came here? Fifteen and a half. Two months after I came to this country, I got a job in the pit, working okay. in the pit, Adam Spit Neville. And I retired at 81 and a half from the Ridge Pip Corporation in Virginia. And how old are you now? I'll be 86 in March. Do you sing every day? Oh, yes, every day. And every night? Every night. Is singing part of your family tradition? Oh, yes, oh, yes. My, the first, uh, song, first song that I sang, the little song, you know, Sur que je mette le blonde. But the, 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 my dad and, and John and I used to sing together all the time. French is my language. I was born in French. I, I went to school two weeks in, in this country. I learned two words, table and shoes. No schooling at all. My uncle, my two brothers, and I were supposed to leave uh, our native land of France and come to this country to join our family. It was the 14th day of July, Bastille Day. And our city was beautiful, decorated. The band were playing, and, and the flag was swinging at the breeze. When the band started to play La Marseillaise, <coughs> tears running down our cheeks. But we joined the crowd and we started to sing Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Now, 71 years later, I think you should all rise and we sing the last strain of the Star Bangalore Band. Yeah? Oh, say the dash stars spangled banner yet wave Oh, the land and all the free and the hope of the brave Thank you, thank you very much. The word location really comes from Michigan. It was used whenever something was located in a wild area. They had to say where it was going to be, the location is. And that was transferred to mining properties. When they first started the mining operations, it would be a small operation that built a location. But as time went on, they started budding into the next and the next and the next. Merritt was considered the fastest growing town in the Iron Range in 1892. Um, for example, in February, it was dense forest. By July, there was uh, 40 buildings there and 300 people. Merritt was um, kind of a different town because it didn't, never had a railroad connection. And so that really limited them, although they said that they had a good water supply and good drainage and it was on Embarrass Lake and they liked that. Old Masaba was kind of one of those towns that had, it was a boom and bust town, but over and over and over again. Um, they had a boom and bust town by the 18, end of the 1800s, they had a railroad line extend there, so it kind of had a little boom and bust, and then it kind of went dormant for a while. And they had their own lighting system too in 1914, which was kind of unusual too. They had their own lighting and water systems. But after World War I, Oliver pulled out, and the town went downhill very quickly. I believe Cooley is one, for example, which started as a location and then evolved into a town site. So once they were incorporated, they of course had their own form of government then, and they had the ability then to, to tax and to provide services as well. I got a phone call from an older gentleman, I could tell he was a little bit older, and he said, I'd like to give you a train. Alan said, it's got to come back to Itasca County. He said, I was raised in Cooley. My mom was the postmaster there. It took me 25 years to build this. So half of it is the Nashwalk and half is Cooley. 
Cooley uh, eventually disappeared. The Butler Brothers were one of the best companies to work for. They, would, they provided their people with clubhouses. Another good thing I remember about Cooley is that it was kind of non-traditional. The women played very important roles there. They sometimes had women carpenters building their own houses, and then the women did everything from running the belts to the washing houses and stuff. We know, according to our pictures, that almost behind every house was a little shack where they had storage. Some of them had garages, but that's where the kids played, and we have a lot of pictures of Every person I know of that was there in Cooley said their memories of childhood are like unbelievable. That's what a child really needed was to be able to play. Their biggest days in Cooley were in the early 1900s, but in 1970 they had 33 people. And Cooley was officially, I think, disbanded in about 1977. Oh, my education at one street, and I would say there was uh, 25 houses, maybe mm -hmm. 12 on each side, 10 on each, something in that order. Every mining location had a pond or a vacant mine or pit to swim in. Like the kids in the Myers, they went swimming in a certain place, Shenango went another place, Monroe, Hartley, everybody went swimming in their own place. Their school had uh, four rooms in it and then upstairs and the downstairs. But we had uh, four class, big classrooms that were the main ones. Mm -hmm. And a playground with a slide and swings in the merry-go-round. In this Meyer school, we had the first and second were together, third and fourth, and the fifth and sixth. But one, so that made three of them, and then they had a, a kindergarten. In 1903, Virginia City Council voted to limit the number of saloons in Virginia to 52, to 52 saloons. Even McKinley, with a population of 186, had 10 saloons. Now, in Austrian location, uh, almost every other place was a uh, place where they made their own booze and liquor. When these b blind pigs, as they were called, home brew places, were formed, and every town had them. Every location had them. A blind pig is a place that it illegally sells alcohol or it sells illegal alcohol. Um, most of them were pretty much what you'd consider a dive a low-class establishment. It's where a lot of loggers or miners went. And the thing is they operated outside of town limits. So the town couldn't do a thing about them, but the company could. And the company, of course, did its thing that it always did. Whenever you are a danger, whenever you feel you can't do your work fast enough, they made things safe for everybody again. They fired you. The mining the mines went on for years and years hiring and firing their way to profits and safety. It was the last year that people were living here in Sparta and people were vacating their homes and, and, I, and I started singing that uh, special song, it's called Ghost Town. I related to that line, this town is becoming like a ghost town, it really was. I moved here in October 2005. When I was looking at this place, they told me that 10 years from now everybody's going to be moving out of here and I didn't really think much of it. I th it sounded like a rumor. And there's still little kids Living. running around and they rode their bikes up and down the hill and they used to use our backyard as a sledding hill. And, and they're the crazy little kids running around and I, I, I kind of miss them.
We grew up uh, from the beginning in, in Sparta. That's where our, our family house was, and our grandparents had a house right down the street from us. Our dad grew up there. Our, um, our grandparents grew up there as well. Our dad's grandparents on both sides em were the first generation to immigrate and um, all 100% Finnish and all settled in Sparta. Like a lot of early immigrants, they came just looking for a better life and um, I think it made sense for a lot of people to come from Finland to work in timber and mining industries in northern Minnesota. Primarily everybody in the family has worked at the mines, including great-grandparents, grandparents. grandparents. Um, our grandmother worked there. We both worked there during the summer when we were in college. That's where our dad worked for um, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone I've ever met that's from here, they talk about it like you know, it's just a, just a wonderful place to live and grow up. Everybody knew each other. It was leased land and people just owned the homes, but again, they were there for generations, so it was a very long-term lease. I don't think anybody ever expected that they'd have to move. The leases were for 99 years. When they told people to move, you were supposed to remove all the structures from, your, from the property. And most people did, but a lot of the elderly folks didn't have the means to, to tear down their structures or get rid of them. Every once in a while you'll see these pieces of paper stuck on the side of the houses down there, like a bright fluorescent colored document. There's a, still abandoned houses back there. I don't even want to walk down there at night because you just feel the spirits everywhere. The easiest thing that a lot of people ended up doing was having the fire department do, you know, training, burning the house down. That's what happened to the house that we lived in, as well as the house that our grandparents lived in, which was two doors down from there. But they kept the sauna. We grew up taking saunas every week with our extended family. Was it Saturday nights? Saturday night. You know, 10 kids, so how many grandkids are there? There are so many A grandkids. <laughs> um, successive rounds going into, the, going into the sauna. That's a pretty special memory for me to have growing up and experiencing that with, with the family. When it was time to take everything down, we did have a cousin that, that kept it, that took it and moved it to his property. Sometimes even the barren land is gone, the whole town is gone. Other lost towns you can go visit. You can drive by and, and kind of point out here was this and here was that. We were on the corner and then there was um, Anderson's house and then there was my uh, grandmother's house. And then at the end of that road was a trail that went down to the pit. So you could just, it wasn't far at all to just walk down there. And we were forbidden to go down there, but we went down there anyway. We're always gonna have a certain amount of nostalgia around Sparta. There's not <laughs> much left. It's, it's really sad and, and uh, a little bit depressing, but um, I appreciate that he wrote that song because it, yeah, it really kind of pulls at my heartstrings. <laughs> There's one uh, lady who who lives here, and and she said that she heard that song "Ghost Town" and, and it made her cry. And and she and I offered her a, a copy of the CD, and she said, "No, I don't want it." <laughs> I guess my hope for the future of Sparta is that that it gets cleaned up and. Uh, I'd like to see a cross-country ski trail back there or something like that. Because it is a nice, it's, it's a great place to walk around. And
Funding for Minnesota's Lost Mining Towns is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.